Hi, welcome to our YouTube channel, The History Squad. And this is part two in our Hundred Years War series. In part one, we covered the, what sparked the Hundred Years War. And we went through all those different people and who'd had what babies, the wrong kind of babies, and so on and so forth. And we ended up with these two characters. We've got Edward III of England and Philip VI of France. Edward, young, headstrong, a little bit arrogant. Ooh, and then we got Philip VI, belligerent. Ooh, this doesn't look good. So, Battle of Sluys, uh, 24th of June, uh, 1340. But a couple of years before, 1338, there'd been a major catastrophe for Edward III. You see, he had these fighting ships, uh, two of the most famous, the Christopher and the Edward. Uh, the Christopher had cannons on board, I believe four guns. So these were state of the art. And what had happened was they'd been sent across as escorts for a massive wool convoy to Flanders. Yeah, money, revenue that he needed for the forthcoming wars. But unfortunately they were intercepted. This squadron was intercepted by a massive fleet of French ships. They never stood a chance. They stood off, they fought. Our sailors were killed. Arnimuden, I think was the name of the battle. And we lost those warships, those cogs, and the king was heartbroken. So that affected the English Channel, the power in the English Channel. And now the king is going to try and seize power. He's trying to defeat the French fleet. This is vital because the French are attacking Portsmouth and all these other towns. Also the Channel Islands and the Isle of Wight. So we need to do something. Sluys is now in modern day the Netherlands. Uh, it's all silted up now so you wouldn't see it. But I've got a map and we're going to try and lead you through. We've got some models so it'll be great fun especially when I knock it and all the soldiers fall over. That's what normally happens. So the battle is about to commence. The king sent two knights forward over land to have a look and see what the French were doing. What in fact they had done was blocked the entire estuary with their ships, row upon row. In fact, it was described as if there was a forest of masts floating upon the sea. There were that many, yeah? But you could see the English cogs at the one end, the Christopher, the Edward, yeah? So the French had included them in their navy. The two knights report back, the French are blocking our way. We shouldn't go. We should stand fast. Well, Edward was still this young man and he bawled the knights out. No way. He stormed up and down the deck, shouting his orders. We're going to go. We're going to go. Everybody's kind of going, ooh. And the ship set sail. But the French had made the most massive mistake. They chained all their ships together. They had formed one almighty fighting platform. In those days, naval warfare, he didn't stand off like at, uh, with the HMS victory at Trafalgar. He didn't stand off and fire and so on and so forth and board later. You uh, hopefully grappled the enemy ships, brought them in, bang. But the king, as soon as he saw that the French ships were all shackled together, he laughed. He knew he was going to win the day. And the reason being is how he formed his navy. Now I've got some models here and I want to show you what an English cog with the fore and stern castle looked like. So this is a, a model, a model kit of the Thomas, the flagship for Edward III at Sluys. And you can see the forecastle here, bowmen all lined up. There are some along the belly of the ship and then the stern castle. And then right on the top of the mast, you have the top uh, castle here and bowmen loaded up to the gunnels. Literally, as they move the ship around, they'll be shooting down into the galleys and the French ships. This puts them above any enemy ships. Now, these are slow moving. Their advantage is the forecastle and the stern castle. But when they're up against the galleys of the French Navy, which were actually Genoese, if you want the truth. I hadn't got a model of a French galley, so I made one. These had oars 
and a massive sail. They were very narrow on the beam and light draft in the water, so they were very, very manoeuvrable. However, what the French had done is they'd anchored these all together. So there they are in a line abreast. The English cogs are coming in now. The first thing they're going to do is just rain sheer hell down on the French. The French didn't have very many crossbowmen. I believe only around 500. 20,000 armed sailors plus 150 men-at-arms. So they were not um, as well armed as the English. The English had about three to 5,000 archers and 1,500 men-at-arms plus the armed sailors. So we didn't have as many ships as the French, but we had far more fighting men. And the way the king uh, arrayed his navy, which I think is fantastic, is he would have two cogs full of bowmen, and then he would have a third cog full of men-at-arms. Behind them, there will be a reserve, another ship, and this will be filled with a mixture of bowmen and, and men-at-arms. And they would go in, rake the enemy ships, pouring the arrows into them, decimating the crews. The cog with the men-at-arms would simply smash into them and board. But if you start at the one end, you start to take the ships. As French sailors run the other way, they're going to start to crowd out the other ships. And what the English found was that just one or two cogs would capture several French ships. Let me show you on the diagram what happened. So here is Sluiz. This is the estuary blocked by the French fleet. Now, don't forget, they'd anchored themselves, tied all the ships together. The Christopher and the Edward, so I understand, were at this far end. The king is way out of view when he hears from his two knights that the French have blocked the estuary, but he storms forward. As he comes around the headland, he has three ranks of ships, three lines of ships. Yeah, and he's got that formation where it's two cogs full of archers with their boarding party in the second, the men at arms. When he sees the French are tied and they can't move. It's, he laughs because there is a wind that is for the English fleet. It's against the French. Many of the French ships try to disengage, but it's too late. And of course, when the battle is well on, ships from Sluise, the Flemish ships with um, armed men on board who were loyal to the English, attack the French fleet from the rear. Some of the Genoese, the mercenaries, escape with their fast moving galleys. This battle was immense. It shows the bowmen not shooting great distance to sting the enemy like as at Agincourt. These guys are shooting close quarter and they're going to be raining those arrows down on many men who simply did not have armour. At the end of the day, Edward, bless him, captured his ship, the Edward and the Christopher, countless French ships. But the tragedy for the French was that there's anything up to 20,000 men perished, many of them jumping into the water. People at the time said that if the fish in the sea could speak, they would have learned to speak French now. Bodies for French sailors were being washed up for days upon days after the battle. You can't visit the site anymore. It's all silted up. It's just part of the mainland of the Netherlands. But I think it's a battle which should have more said about it. 20,000 French dead? Negligible of how many English were killed? Well, I hope you've enjoyed our little film here. I hope you like my models because I actually made the galley out of scrap wood. Thanks very much for your time. If you've enjoyed it, thumbs up. If you've not subscribed, then subscribe and then ding the bell. Thank you very much and stand by for part three because that's the Cressy campaign and that's when I really get going. Thank you very much for your time.